All right, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time. Much appreciated. This is Chris Cotillo of MassLive.com. He ran a workshop. You still run a workshop, but you were running a workshop a couple of years ago when I was on your Zoom workshop with sports uh, journalism writers. Um, and then I took your class at PC, which was awesome. And we've been friends ever since. So thank you so much for taking the time. Much appreciated. Anytime. You're the only uh, double graduate of the workshop and the BC class, which there's a lot of similarities in, but that's history, really. You made history. So congrats on that. I was I was very lucky, very fortunate to take you as twice as a teacher, I guess, right? I mean, mm -hmm. times, even though they call you what, an adjunct professor or something, right? They had a word for it or? Adjunct instructor. Yeah. Adjunct so, instructor. Not, not, not a real one. There you go. Well, you're a professor in my eyes regardless, uh, but thank you for taking the time. Much appreciated. How are you doing though? I'm good. Just uh, kind of waiting for the beginning of the Red Sox season. Two weeks to go. Obviously not in spring training right now. So, and I'm not going back. So uh, it's uh, just kind of waiting for the end of the monotonous springtime and waiting for the season to start and see wherever that takes us. Absolutely true. True. That's definitely the truth of it. We got two weeks until the season starts. So now it's just a lot of waiting, uh, which obviously now we'll get to the Red Sox and we'll talk a little UNC maybe at the end. Um, but with the Red Sox off season, Obviously, it wasn't what fans were expecting. I think people thought when High and Bloom left, the Red Sox were just going to spend a lot of money right away and get back to their old ways. What have you seen in the offseason with Craig Breslin? I know it's just his first offseason. Didn't make too many big moves. I mean, Giolito was the big move, and obviously that really hasn't gone as planned. But what did you see from the Red Sox this offseason, especially considering they were just interest kings, it seemed like, a lot of time. They were interested in so many players but just never got a deal done. Uh, what have you seen this offseason with them? Yeah, I mean, I think the big storyline is not really Greg Breslow. It's not Alex Cora. It's ownership and them deciding at some point that the budget was not going to be as high as I think everybody else in the organization, the fan base wanted, you know, and I think that ultimately we've uh, kind of as fans and reporters and all that type of stuff, think about, you know, the the chief baseball officer, or the GM, whoever it is, as the final decision maker, whether that was Dombrowski or Charrington or Theo or Heim in the past. And, you know, this has kind of been eye opening to everybody that the ownership sets the tone, they set the budget, they set the strategy. Um, and from what we can gather, you know, John Henry set a low budget at the beginning of the winter. And Craig Breslow had to operate under that. And that's why he made the moves that he did, you know in a perfect world, do they trade sale or do they add, you know, pitching on top of sale? They probably add pitching, but you know, they, they found that that move was on the table. They could move some salary. They could move off of him and add a second baseman in the meantime. Um, you know, like they had to do everything under these limitations. And I think, you know, the disconnect between that and coming out and telling your fans, you're going to go full throttle is something that fans aren't going to forget for a while. So it's hard for me to sit here today on March 15th and say the Red Sox are better than they were a year ago when they finished 78 and 84. Everybody knows they added Giolito, Von Grissom, Tyler O'Neill. Okay, that's the guys they added. But they got rid of Sale. They also lost Paxton, Duvall, Justin Turner, Verdugo. You know, you're asking for a lot. Um, and, you know, Giolito is not going to contribute. Even if he was in the roster, they're probably not good as good as they were last year. And he's probably going to miss the whole year. So I think, you know, the strategy uh, is – not what fans wanted or expected. The messaging was horrific all off season. I think they lied to their fans repeatedly. I think it was insulting. Um, and so, you know, they're going to have find less interest in this team and this team's probably not going to be very good. And it's kind of all their own doing. Yeah. It's honestly disappointing as a Red Sox fan, considering in the off season heading into it, there were a lot of big free agents, which there's still some guys in the market. Blake mm -hmm. Snell, obviously Jordan Montgomery, two guys that yep. haven't signed. I expected the Red, Red Sox to make one big move and get, uh, Blake Snell, at one point, I thought they were going to get, which I'd say it's probably not going to happen. What do you what do you think the chances are the Red Sox were to get Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery? Today's March 15th. What are the chances on today, you know, in, in the future from today on that the Red Sox would have a chance at signing one of those guys? If they have not fit into their budget, which is super low. You know, if the market craters and they take $10 million a year, maybe, but that's not going to happen. And, <laughs> um, you know, Blake Snell doesn't fit them for a variety of reasons. Number one. He has a draft pick attached, and for a team that's looking to the future and looking to build, they're just not going to give up that draft pick for him. And at this point, it looks like he's going to be a guy who takes that short-term deal with an opt-out. If you know he takes a three-year, $100 million deal that's really a one-year, $35 million deal with an opt-out after this year, that doesn't fit either, just because mm -hmm. you know the Red Sox are not focused on contending in 24. That's kind of, they've made that very clear. Um, and so Montgomery, I think, makes more sense. I think it makes a lot of sense. It's just his price and what the Red Sox have been willing to do have not matched up. And I don't think they're they're even close, you know. And there's a lot of teams. I think there's a few different points here. 
you know, three things I'll mention quickly. Um, the way they structured Bayo's contract was to add to the CBT this year, even though it's really they're only adding $300,000 in real payroll to the CBT calculations based on average annual value. They're adding nine. That gets them within, you know, 22, 23 million of the 237 threshold, which they're going to be under. They're going to want to be under. Tough to see, you know, Montgomery fitting in under that. And if they wanted to sign Montgomery, they could have easily pushed Bayo's deal, you know, accounting wise to next year. So I think that was a big clue. Number two, the Dylan Cease trade. If there were any chance, it hurts even more just because, you know, a team that we didn't expect to be in on any of the big free agents went and got Dylan Cease in San Diego. That leaves the Padres, the Rangers, the Angels, the Yankees, all those teams that were in on, you know, Cease. They still want starting help. Those teams, I think, are the teams looking at Montgomery and Snell, and they're, you know, going to be aggressive and, uh, you know, probably more aggressive than you you would have thought. Um, and then the other thing is the Giolito, um, the Giolito injury, I think, um, to me, it makes it seem like the Red Sox are even less likely to sign Montgomery because, you know, he was a guy who uh, – they were counting on for 200 innings and now they've sunk $20 million into that roster spot. Are they going to sink $40 million into one roster spot on a non-contending team? Probably not. So I just look at all those factors and think, you know, I didn't think it was going to happen before he's still out there. He's working out. He was working out at BC for much of the winter. We all know that, but you know, it just, uh, it just doesn't seem like they're ready to go all in. Um, there's an argument, a great argument to be made that they should, but they're just, you know, they haven't budged to this point. And I think, you know, um, as you said, fans are disappointed. Absolutely. I think you put that all perfectly. I think it was something you wrote and then also Pete Abraham as well said something like if the Red Sox weren't going to, you know, pay a guy like Blake Snow, Jordan Montgomery with Giolito in the rotation to try to right. strengthen the rotation with those two guys, they weren't going to do it before Giolito got hurt. They're not going to do it now that Giolito's mm -hmm. up for the year. So I think that's probably, you know, a tough thing for fans to hear, but I wouldn't say we're surprised, honestly, at this point, considering how the last few years have gone. They haven't really been willing to give out any big contract besides, I guess, Trevor Story, and then obviously the big Devers extension, but mm -hmm. it's really been, you know, trying to stay away from those big contracts, uh, which is tough to see, but at the end of the day, can't be too shocked. The Red Sox, the message in the offseason, it seems like from Cora and obviously Sam Kennedy as well, that they feel like they have enough pitching, you know, with the guys they have. And I saw your opening day projections. You have Bayo, Pavetta. Crawford, Hoke, Whitlock. Do you actually think the Red Sox believe they have enough pitching as is, or do you think that's just a message to the fans to pretend that they feel like they know what they're doing, but at the end of the day, they're really just not trying to spend money? Yeah, it's a message to the roster. I mean, it's it'd be tough for Alex Cora, or Craig Breslow, or Sam Kennedy to say, you know, no, these guys aren't good enough. We need to add, you know, they have to have that kind of faux vote of confidence in their players. I think if you put true serum in anybody in the organization, they know they don't have enough in terms of rotation arms you know i think that's very very clear you know they could use one maybe two more starters easily um and rafael devers basically said that too so i think it's very tough for you know the those who are in uniform knowing that they don't have the ownership commitment behind them um but it's just the, the where they are right now and they have to i guess do the best they can with it um when you were down at spring training what players stood out to you uh whether it be pitching young guys Guys that are already, you know, big leaguers like Tristan Casas, Rafael Devers. What plays have stood out to you the most? Yeah, I mean, I think just pitching wise, Justin Slayton, the Rule Five pick, throws gas. You know, really good uh, advanced metrics on his stuff. Usually, this time of year, we're talking about, oh, will the Rule Five guy make the trip, make the team? Will he not? You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and with him, it's just like he seems like he's a lock uh, because he's just been so impressive. Um, especially with Schreiber gone and, and probably Whitlock and Hauk no longer in the. Yeah, uh, bullpen mix, like you need a guy like that to step up. They're very happy about them. I think obviously, you know, look at, you know, Tyler O'Neill just jacked. Uh, we knew that when you see that in person, it's a little different. He just gets scratched from the lineup again. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think being that muscle bound has worked against him throughout his career injuries wise. It's something he's working on. You know, I don't think the Red Sox are counting on 150 games from him, but think there is some upside there and some, he can play a little bit. So, um, you know, Garrett Whitlock looks totally different. Uh, I think he's, you know, a lot stronger. Bayo is a lot stronger. So the eye test, you know, that's always well and good this time of year. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, is that going to be enough for them to be out of last place in the East? I doubt it.
Yeah, that that is a big problem. I think O'Neill is obviously a good add, but at the end of the day, he's only really a rotational outfielder guy that would probably be starting maybe or you know on the bench for a majority of games, which it's not like you're adding a big piece to the lineup. I felt like right. last year we had Duvall in the lineup. I felt like he was a bigger add, adding him last offseason than adding O'Neill this offseason. But I guess, you know, we'll see how he does, you know, in, in the regular season. But one guy that's done very well in spring training is Trevor Story. He's looked good in 321 and 942 OPS. Do you think he can get back to the numbers he had when he was a Rocky? Yeah, I've been high on him. You know, I think the the first year you have to look at the way he came in. You know, he had was dealing with a lot that 10 days he was in camp, signed the contract. There was a dispute about the contract because he wouldn't get the vaccine. So that's self-inflicted, but still was, a dis, you know, a little bit of a delay. Um, had the baby, had to fly home to Texas, came back, was as sick as a dog, had some horrible stomach bug, lost some weight, and just could not get into a rhythm early in 2022. <laughs> And, you know, we saw that when he got booed kind of in the second or third homestand of the year at Fenway. Um, and that after that, he heated up. He was really good for a couple of months. And, you know, people always pointed to when he was healthy for them in 2022, they had like a 750 win percentage. You know, like he really was a key factor to that. Obviously, you know, Bogarts was on the team and JD and some of these other guys. Um, so he was not the centerpiece in the lineup. And then, you know, injuries, you know, he got hurt kind of on a freak thing, broke his hand. The team kind of misdiagnosed that in the summer of 2022, missed September that year. And then the elbow thing, you know, costing him most of last year. Now he's finally healthy as a regular spring training and is going to be at his spot at shortstop. So I think, you know, the sky is the limit for him. He's uh, as all the, all the right attitude, everything like that has really stepped up as a leader. I think he's going to have a very good year. I, I would agree. I think the main thing with him is obviously the bat, the consistency at the plate wasn't really there, but he showed some obviously stretches where he was still, you know, like the player he was on the Rockies, but his defense was huge to the lineup last year, especially considering yeah. the Red Sox from second last year in errors in the MLB, uh, which is something they're trying to address is obviously defense. Uh, Rafael Devers, I mean, he had a not a great year defensively at third base, but he had some plays where it was like, you could see his range getting better, obviously his mm-hmm. glove getting better, but it's still not fully there yet. So having Trevor Story in that left side of the diamond with him, Definitely helps. Um, and then another guy that's done well in spring training, now switching over to pitching, Garrett Whitlock. He has struggled a little bit, but a guy that's really surprised, Tanner Hoke, uh, and then obviously as well, uh, Cutter Crawford. What do you think the Red Sox are going to do with the rotation one through five? Do you think Crawford ends up being the three or the four? Obviously, with Giolito getting hurt, the whole, you know, uh, rotation's yeah. getting messed up. I mean, Bayo, Pavetta, and Crawford are locked in. I think Hauk is getting close to that point uh, just because he's been good in spring training and he has the track record. I think they're going to try to keep him locked in there. And then that fifth spot, you know, I, I think we could see a surprise. Cooper Criswell uh, mm-hmm. could be a guy that sneaks into that spot. Winkowski got shelled yesterday, but he's in the mix and Whitlock as well. So, you know, I think it's going to be one of those guys and they're going to try to see what they can do and mix and match and try to get – you know, somebody to pitch that fifth game of the year. Um, but everybody knows it's going to take more than five starters to get them through the season anyway. So, um, you know, I think that's that's an issue too, not just, you know, the lack of like front end talent where you're, you're banking on, you know, put it this way, last year they sent Nick Pavetta to the bullpen because he was so bad as a starter in May, and now he's a candidate to start opening day for them. That's not because Nick Pavetta became a Cy Young Award winner overnight. It's because they don't have anybody else. Um, okay. And the other thing is that I think um, – you know, not so they don't have the front end guys. They also don't have the depth. And so, you know, those guys that I mentioned, Cooper Criswell was a guy who was DFA'd by the Rays over the winter. He's impressed them and he's been, seems like a good find. Um, but a guy like Brandon Walter might be your next in line and he's, you know, no, no longer really a prospect. I mean, there's uh, a lot of, I think, uh, issues with the depth at the upper levels of the minors are trying to address that. But you know, last year during the summer, the last two years, you know, in, in 2022, we saw Waka, Evaldi, and Hill kind of all get hurt at the same time. And they called up Crawford, Winkowski, Bayo, and Seabold. And those guys struggled, but at least they had those guys. You know, last year we saw, you know, some of these guys get called up and be uh, in, you know, you had Bayo hurt to start the year. You had Whitlock hurt for two or three times. You had Hauk out for two months. Kluber was out for a long time. Um this year already Giolito, like there's no way that these guys don't get hurt even more. And there's just no depth to sustain that. So um, for that reason, I still think they're a pitcher too short, you know, someone like Michael Lorenzen or Mike Clevenger makes a lot of sense, but they just seem to be, you know, not even in high on those guys either. Yeah. They're really reluctant, <clears throat> excuse me, really reluctant to add to any, you know, piece of the rotation, whether it's top end, like a Blake Snell, Montgomery, or even just a depth guy to have 
you know, at the three or four uh, in the rotation. But for me, I'd say my biggest X factor and under the radar guy in the rotation, I think Cutter Crawford could end up being the best pitcher on the team in the rotation uh, this season. Who would you say is the most under the radar guy within those, you know, that one through five you mentioned, which obviously none of these guys are, you know, aces probably in most teams eyes, but of the guys that the Red Sox have to work with, who would you say is most under the radar? Yeah, I'd probably agree on on Crawford just because if you look at you know the games he pitched last year, uh, under the hood numbers, stuff, war, uh, performance, really, really good. I think the issue was just not pitching deep into games. He sometimes wouldn't get through five, barely ever got through six. You know, mm-hmm. they're going to need more of that. Um, you know, Cora wants 25 innings out of his rotation every, you know, time through. So everybody to go five, that's very important. You know, and I think that, early in the season they're going to be careful with those guys but you need you know Crawford you need Hauk you need Whitlock and and Bayo the younger guys to go deeper uh, in the games than they have this was a problem with Eduardo Rodriguez early in his career and he figured it out of like how do you adjust and face a guy for a third time Hauk's never been able to figure out that's the big knock on him as a starter Mm -hmm. you know Crawford um, is a guy that kind of came out of nowhere to be pretty good last year and he's going to have a chance. Um, but, you know, they're asking a lot out of a lot of guys. And I think Bayo's always had the upside, and we've seen that in stretches, um, you know, of him being really good. But Crawford is a guy who, you know, was not a high draft pick and not a high prospect and looked like a swingman type. You know, Hauk, uh, uncertain. Whitlock, kind of uncertain. Pavetta, consistently inconsistent throughout his career. They're mm-hmm. asking for a lot out of those guys. Maybe Andrew Bailey unlocks all of them, but – um, that's a big ask. Andrew Bailey, that was a great addition. That was one of the more under-the-radar additions for the Red Sox this offseason. Adding him, obviously, to the pitching staff has been huge. And hopefully, you know, we see that work one does, which we'll see how they look on opening day. Uh, just a couple more questions about the Red Sox. Then I'll just have one question about UNC, and I'll, I'll let you go. But uh, what are your expectations this year for Tristan Casas? Which there are some people that are talking, you know, saying that he could be you know, an all-stop first baseman this year uh, in the A. What are your expectations for him this season? Yeah, I think the sky's the limit. I think he's been... You know, he was excellent down the stretch last year. The process, the expected stats, all that, even early in the year when he was hitting the ball hard but into outs, you know, suggested that that was coming. And, you know, for a guy to be hitting 200 or whatever through May and finish third in the AL Rookie of the Year voting, I voted I had him second. Very Mm -hmm. impressive. I think the big, you know, the the big thing for him that comes into play now is just improved defense. You know, that's going to come probably with being out there every day. We saw for the first four months of last season, he was uh, basically only out there against righties and Turner was playing and he was struggling. And there was a point where, you know, Alex Gore was getting fed up with his defense down the stretch when he was playing every day. It got a little bit better. Um, you know, I think with him, it's always the let him be himself because he does all the weird stuff he does. But at the same time, there's stuff you have to do as a big leaguer. You've got to follow what the coaches want. Try to rein him in a little bit. He's receptive to that. And so I think the defense is the big step forward. But yeah, I think the sky's the limit for him. You know, I think he's become a star already. Very, very popular, especially among young fans uh, because he's quirky. Netflix is only going to help him, all that type of stuff. Um, so I, I could see a huge year out of him. And I think everybody around the league recognizes that. Yeah, everyone's expecting big things from him. Uh, as for the Red Sox, though, as a team, people aren't really expecting much. As of today, where would you say the Red Sox uh, are going to finish in the division? Which I'm not going to ask you to give a win-loss record, but where do you think they fall one through five in the AL East? I think it's just hard to envision anything but fifth right now. You know, you'd have to have one of the other teams collapse. Um, you know, the Yankees, obviously the Cole stuff that's come out the last week is concerning for them. But if you look at, you know, that was a team that, you know, kind of the opposite of what the Red Sox did. You know, they won 82 games or whatever last year, and it was like the sky was falling because they can't ever be that close to last place. And they said, this is not acceptable for us as an organization. We have to go out and get Juan Soto for one year and get a Verdugo for a year and some of these types of deals. Marcus Stroman, you know, these are ballsy, risky moves. You know, Marcus Stroman's a guy that's had a lot of issues in the past, even with Brian Cashman. Alex Verdugo is a guy that we all know has had a lot of issues too, you know, in a big market here with Cora and the whole thing. And and Juan Soto, you know, you're only getting for a year. Um, And so that's, uh, you know, kind of an all in approach. Tough to see them being bad with that and knowing that if they're in at the deadline, they're going to keep adding. Cashman might feel like he's in job saving mode. Same with Boone. The Orioles won 101 games and traded for Corbin Burns. The Blue Jays, I think Justin Turner, that's a huge addition for them because it seemed to be a team with a lot of talent that didn't have that leadership or that soul. Seeing what Justin Turner brought last year 
on a daily basis. He's an excellent, excellent leader. Really embraced Boston, embraced the whole thing. Um, and had a great year at the plate. He can still hit for an old man, too. Um, and then the Rays, you know, I always say you, me, and seven other guys in their lineup, they could find a way to win, you know, 95 games. Like, they're just that good. Uh, they're basically, you know, like they find a way no matter what to win games, platoon, all that type of stuff. And so, you know, it's tough to see the Red Sox with the roster is currently constructed, you know, especially with Giolito out and some of these other guys banged up and all the uncertainty in their rotation, you know, being anywhere but fifth. I, I would say I'm probably in the middle of like, you know, third or fourth right now, which that's probably higher than most. But I had, how, how, who could they possibly beat out? I have them better than Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay didn't really add too much this offseason. They always doesn't find matter. Them. Like you yes. said, and then I would say Toronto, I thought they were a little bit on the downtrend uh, from last year, you know, heading into this year. It's George Springer is getting older and obviously Guerrero's had some trade rumors around them. Uh, I feel like they could, you know, take a step down. But even with that, even if they lose, what, three or four less games, they still have a better record than the Red Sox did last year. Right. So it's obviously going to be tough if they were to finish third or fourth, but uh, that would be better than what most people are expecting. But I also keep this in, in mind. I am biased since I'm a Red Sox fan. Right. Uh, and the optim eternal optimist, too. That's I try my best, don't I? I'll ask you one quick question. UNC Pittsburgh tonight, ACC semifinal game. Uh, what are your expectations for UNC in the tournament? That as the tournament being March Madness. And then also how are you feeling about tonight's game? I think, you know, tonight is um, you know, I, I don't want to say a trap type field because but you know, it's a team in Pitt that's fa that's fighting for their tournament lives. Um mm -hmm. And so that's always dangerous when you get in these conference tournaments because, you know, UNC is going to be, you know, either the last one seed or the best two seed, yep. no matter if they win tonight, lose tonight, win the ACC tournament. And so I feel like sometimes it could be a little bit of a trap for the good teams who are locked in and when you're playing a team like Pitt that's fighting for their lives. So that might scare me a little bit. I know Pitt's pretty good. Caroline hasn't played them since like December 30th, so I haven't seen them in a while. But you know, the way Carolina's played the last couple of weeks, you know, beating Duke on the road the other night, um, mainly, but just beating Florida State, who's not bad, by 25 yesterday in the first game. Um, you know, Cormac Ryan, who went to high school in Massachusetts, hitting a lot of uh, a lot of threes, which he did not do throughout the season. If he can shoot like that, kind of give him the element that Manic gave them a couple of years ago, um, it's tough to beat them. RJ's obviously had an incredible year. Baycott's Baycott. You know, Harrison Ingram, I think, is one of my favorite Tar Heels ever just because he's he's done everything you possibly can, um, you know, and as a transfer in the first year, gets rebounds at a crazy clip for someone to place his position. Mm -hmm. um, he can shoot the three, can drive, plays great defense, like everything you could possibly want. He's been excellent. So, you know, they've they've been very, very fun to watch. They've, uh, you know, kind of a team of superstars that have no egos. So that's been great. Um, I was hoping for, you know, at everybody's sake that BC could beat UVA last night and that we would no. have the BC because no, because I think BC would have beaten NC State tonight and gotten into the final. And uh, not that I would tell the Tar Heels, not that I have access to them, to, uh, you know, to throw the game to let BC, you know, sneak in with a bid. But it would have been fun to see see Carolina and BC play each other. I think big tournament-wise, I think they're definitely in the mix. Um, you know, it's, for me, selfishly, uh, having them as a two-seed in the East, which they've been projected for a long time, was kind of my goal because that goes through Boston, um, but then they have to play UConn. So double-edged sword of being able to go, but also facing them. And now it looks like, you know, especially if they win tonight and win the ACC, probably a one seed in the West uh, where they get to avoid Houston, Purdue, and UConn. That feels pretty good to me, even if I don't get to go. So, I, you know, I think sky's the limit for them. Um, they This is the time of year that that program gets to be you know, really, really good. You know, they it's not Roy Williams' team anymore, but Hubert Davis, you know, led a bad team to the championship game a couple of years ago, and now he has a really good team. So, as always, go Heels. Yeah, it's a big bounce back season for them this year. So, I'm happy for your sake to see them really get back on track. And I'm hoping Cormac Ryan shoots like he did against Duke. If he does that, I don't think anybody's going to beat UNC when he puts yeah, up 30, what did, 31 in that game. Yep. That was ridiculous. Uh, but hopefully, for your sake, though, they do win. I'll be rooting for them for you. So, best of luck. But thank you so much, Chris, for taking the time. Much appreciated as always. And I'll make sure to give a good shout out to your workshop in the description on Spotify. So thank you so much though. And on YouTube as well. Uh, thank Anytime, you so much. Man. Much Thanks appreciated and uh, best of luck to UNC. Take care. Thanks.